Jeff Johnson, I'm really happy you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, you are the pastor of, it's a really long name, your church. I'm one of the uh, pastors of the Grace Emanuel Reformed Baptist Church here in Grand Rapids, Northeast Grand Rapids. G-I-R-B-C B-C. is the, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, so Reformed Baptist Church, here's my leading question because I want to hit you hard. Mm-hmm. Should all professing Baptists become Reformed Baptists, and why? Yes. <laughs> well, I say that, first of all, generally, because whatever, usually, and there are exceptions to this, usually the church or the kind of church you're in, if you come to it by conviction... Uh, come to what by conviction? That you should be in that church, that its doctrine is the correct So not just doctrine. Christianity specifically, but yeah, to, but to uh-huh. that specific local church. And there are two things that go with that. You're not saying that every other denomination or type of church is not a legitimate church, or people are only true Christians if they come to your kind of church. But having become a Christian, then you think, okay, well, what kind of church should I be a part of? What's the most, you know, what's the closest to the Bible that I can be a part of? And as you search for that, and if you come to a conviction, this is the closest that I know, of course you're thinking, well, I think this is the truth, and I think people should, whether they call themselves Reformed Baptists or Fellowship Church or Community Church, that this is the doctrine that Christians should should believe. Mm. And so um, being Reformed, I believe that that's historic biblical Christianity that shows up in the creeds and the confessions. And though there are certain divisions among Reformed Christians, uh, we in many ways still hold to the same basic reform convictions, and we believe those things are important. We believe they're in, they're in catechisms. We're, we believe they're in confessions. Though those are not inspired documents, they're very excellent documents that express what we believe the Bible teaches. And so we want to promote Christianity for the lost to be saved, but we also want the Christians to come to a greater knowledge of the truth. And I don't say that looking down my snout like I've arrived, but you, you do have convictions that I believe this is true. This is how the church should be ordered. This is the doctrine that should be preached. And mm-hmm. So it is right to try to promote that mm-hmm. uh, in ways that are uh, that you can. So you talk about arriving, and it's interesting that having read at least one of your testimonies online is it seems like your personal journey was one of uh, well a, a journey, almost a pilgrim's program mm-hmm. pro- progress ish journey from I think you stated you were saved around the age of nine. And then uh, maybe was it baptized at 14? No, you baptized them, but something else happened at 14. And then another thing happened. It was this continual journey along that kind of path of assurance of salvation. And not only that, but then, and the reason for my opening question was you, I believe, were on staff or actually in a ministry Mm -hmm. or a clergy position at an SBC church, or Southern Baptist Convention for for listeners who don't know. And then um, resigned your position to mm-hmm. to uh, join a reformed church. So it's a really interesting journey you've had, and mm-hmm. I think also another reason for my question is in this context of what's ha- been happening with the SBC, the Southern mm-hmm. Baptist Convention, and them trying to kind of like clarify their positions on things, mm-hmm. and some churches feeling like, well, maybe this isn't where we're supposed to be, mm-hmm. and the hope is not that they would then go. Uh, I would say more progressive Christianity, but actually, hey, maybe some of them will think, I think we need to look more closely at these creeds, at mm-hmm. confessions, at things that in maybe a unlearned Christian's view might be more, that's kind of Roman Catholic, or right. that's, right. isn't that, you know, liturgy is a scary right. thing mm-hmm. kind of a position. Yeah. Yeah, so just a, a brief rundown of, of my story that you alluded to. Well, we can go deep into your story. I'd love and, to hear. To, to clarify is that I was uh, born and, and, and raised in Southern Baptist churches. Um, and I was born when my parents were attending or members of a, of a Southern Baptist church in upstate South Carolina. And uh, so I'm 48, so 1975, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. I um, can remember going to church as a small boy. At age nine, I made a profession of faith and was baptized. That was in 1984, a long time ago. And I wasn't really, looking back, I really wasn't converted then. And then later on, I got involved in a youth group and and uh, got involved in church life, and I'll skip some of that. And I really wasn't truly converted until I was a senior in high school. I had gotten a hold of the book, The Gospel According to Jesus by John MacArthur, at like age 16, 
and that that was really the first time that I ever recall hearing a more biblically, uh, really the biblical gospel that you must, you know, that repentance, fruit, all those things. It was really speaking against easy believism because that's what I grew up in. You know, if you have this experience, you pray this prayer, you have this experience, don't ever doubt that you're saved. Like record the day and time. That kind of thing, right. And the carnal Christian theory. Now, I didn't hear that language, the carnal Christian doctrine necessarily, but that was, you know, you can basically, if you're saved, you're on your way to heaven, you may not live like it, but take that second step, make Jesus Lord, that whole paradigm. I was raised in that. And, and when I came across the real gospel, about two and a half years later, I was truly converted, and that kind of started that. But I was still Southern Baptist. I went on uh, staff at a Southern Baptist church as a youth minister. I wasn't like a main pastor, associate pastor type position Very at a very young age. I was actually 18, almost 19 when that happened. And then in the fall of, of, um, of 1995, I was introduced to the doctrines of grace or to the five points of Calvinism. And I had already, I had already, I already knew from my conversion experience that God had done something in me and to me and for me. I couldn't do in and to and for myself because I had tried to be a Christian, and the Lord really did a powerful work in my my life. And so I think that set me up for being open to the doctrines of grace. And so I studied those out, came to the conviction that they're biblical. That then led me into, because it was through Reformed Baptist people that I began, then I was introduced to the 1689, uh, began to, my eschatolo- eschatological view started changing because I was dispensational premillennial, so I ch- that went out the door. My view of ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church started to change, and so it was really kind of a, a revolution in many ways in my life, and I came to embrace the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith as not an inspired but an excellent expression of, of biblical doctrine and embraced Reformed Baptist church polity. Um, I stepped away from the ministry because I felt like I did. I need to get into the ministry in a biblical way. That also changed my view of the call to the ministry. So I spent about a decade out of the ministry before I went back into it. And so that I, I wanted to go in it the way the Lord designed in his, in it, has designed in his word. And so it was quite a, you know, that was kind of, that's kind of a condensed version of, of, of quite the journey. And of course, I still have people I love in the Southern Baptist churches. Of course, there are Southern Baptist churches that are, I think, 1689 and Reformed, and some are not. So, you know, I'm not in any way, you know, saying no, 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 no Southern Baptist church, whatever, because I have my parents are a member, members of, Southern, of a Southern Baptist church where I was raised, and not the church I was raised in, but in the area. And so, but that's quite the quite a journey over a period of time. But I've been in the Reformed Baptist circles now since the mid 90s. Okay. And so, so during that, there's so much I'd like to unpack there, but they, during that 10 year period, mm-hmm. um, where you, so you stepped out of the, that ministry position, mm-hmm. did you, was there an awareness during that decade of at some point I'll get back into the ministry? Well, the context in which I grew up in, there was more of a, a direct revelation view of the call uh, that God has done this work in you. You you know, not necessarily you heard a voice, but you feel the call. And I don't want to exaggerate, but it, when that in that context, um, it, that's kind of an unquestionable thing because this is my experience. The Lord's called me, and in reality, that's more of a direct revelation view, like the apostles or the prophets, the Old Testament. So when I began to realize there is no such direct revelation call now, it comes through, uh, it still comes through special revelation, but through scripture, do you have the qualifications to be an office bearer and w- along with the desire? Um, uh, d- is there a local church that's willing to examine you in light of these qualifications? Not just because you come by and preach a trial sermon one Sunday, they want you to be their pastor, but do you have the goods the gifts and the graces, people who, who know you well, they've examined you. And so when I stepped away from the Southern Baptist uh, ministry position, I was determined that, number one, I realized that there's a possibility that I might not never be, I might never be in the ministry. There was a real possibility, but I was committed that if I get back in the ministry, it's going to be God's way. 
and in God's time. And, and that's, you know, the Lord brought that to pass. So I still had a desire for the ministry. But I, I, you know, I worked in the workplace, if you will, in, in the marketplace for, for about 10 years. Uh, and then I, I became a lay elder. That was, in other words, non-vocational, where I was at at the time, with a view of eventually being full-time somewhere. So I started the process of kind of candidating and looking around. And lo and behold, I'm, I've been in Grand Rapids for 16 years. You said something, speaking of, you mentioned how Scripture is... Um, and well, an essential part of this call mm-hmm. language, and that's that's interesting because I I know when I went to seminary, mm-hmm. uh, before that I was doing kind of like a Timothy program mm-hmm. at the church we were at, which was just an independent Baptist church in Santa Monica, and um, great pastor there named Russ Boone, still there today, and yeah it it was this it was hard for me as a young man to to understand what it meant to be called mm-hmm. because of this lack of clarity on is it some voice talks to you which i would say well no but, right. but is it that enough people around you tell you that's what you should mm-hmm. do well kind of um but really the essence of god speaking to us in his word and you know the I think impressions is maybe the wrong word, but the counsel of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. you know, God telling us, yes, I want you to do this thing for me and for my church. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mystery though. Yeah. It's, I definitely believe that there is, uh, I actually, uh, have taught part of a course for the Reformed Baptist Seminary. I was a graduate from there and, it's an online seminary that our church is one of the overseeing churches, and I did a and also taught part of the course on call and cultivation, and uh, I'm eventually going to teach that whole course and redo it the whole course. But I did eight lectures on what constitutes a call to the ministry, and I put those I put the material under internal call and external call. The internal call uh, begins ordinarily, and I'll say why ordinarily in just a moment. Ordinarily, with a personal desire for the office, to serve in the office of, of pastor, and um, now that desire doesn't, uh, you know, that doesn't, uh, that's not the definitive. A man may desire it and not be qualified, but that's part of it. Um, ordinarily, and I say ordinarily because sometimes a man may have the gifts and graces to do it, but he's hesitant for many reasons, hmm. or. Um, he doesn't want to lay himself out in that kind of life because he's seen what other people have gone have, have gone through. So sometimes an absence of a desire, just like a desire for the ministry can be driven by carnal motives, so can an absence of a desire, right? Because every man should be willing to serve if that's what the Lord wanted him to do. But there's a... You, you know what I'm saying? In other words... Yeah. Yeah. And so, there's a ahead. place, though, for a healthy caution, right? There's a caution, right. There's a caution, for example, if you have, uh, let's say you've got a pretty cush six-figure job and you've got five kids you're supporting, right. I'm not saying this is you, but and then you've got to make a decision like, am I willing to probably take a massive pay cut, right. go to seminary, do that whole thing? Like, It's a, it's a complete pivot mm-hmm. that has implications not just for you. As, you know, I mm-hmm. think a lot of us guys could be like, well, I could live in a box. That's mm-hmm. what God calls me to do, because your wife do that, right? Your kids, right? Live in the box with you, yeah. So, so the internal call is the desire. So, yeah, and I, th- I think that's why, that's why the scriptural call view versus the direct revelation call, it, it's it, it's you don't believe it just because it's safer, but it is safer, because if you have this view like, no, this is what the Lord wants me to do. I had a dream. I mean, I feel it. God's going to burn my house down if I don't obey. You know. <laughs> then that guy can make a very rash decision, quit his six-figure job, and really make a mistake and drag his family around the country and then eventually goes back to his job or something less because it didn't work out. That's why you want the council of elders. You want the council of the people. So a man like that should be very prayerful and careful. That doesn't mean he's being covetous, that he would rather have the money. It's just that he realizes, this is not just me. You know, I have a wife and kids to feed, and... and uh, one of the best distinctions I've ever heard, and it's not original with me, but I think it's important, is 
Um, revealed duties always trump inferred duties. Hmm. Can you unpack that a little bit? A revealed duty is, okay, let me put it this way. The <clears throat> fact that I'm a pastor of Grace Emanuel Foreign Baptist Church is an inferred duty. There is no text in the Bible that says Jeff Johnson should be in the ministry and he must pastor Grace Emanuel Foreign Baptist. That would be revealed. That means whatever happens, I've got to do that. It's an inferred duty that I'm the pastor here. It's an inferred duty that I'm in the ministry. I've, I've calculated, I've looked at the text. Yes, I have the gifts, the graces, desire. There's people who want me to be their pastor. We're good, but that's all inferred. A revealed duty is I've got to love my wife and kids and provide for them. If there's ever a conflict between those two, guess which one wins out? I love Grace Emanuel, but if they say we're not going to pay you anymore, I probably wouldn't be having this interview right now. I'd be, I'd be out, you know, driving a truck or whatever, you know, and that's fine because that's what I'm called to do. So a man like that in that position, like you just cut that scenario is, his revealed duty first and foremost is to provide for his family. That doesn't mean he's not willing to sacrifice, that his wife shouldn't be willing to sacrifice, but he ought to do that very carefully and prayerfully with counsel. Mm -hmm. Elders who perhaps are saying, we believe, and it also depends on how clear it is to others. If the elders are like, yeah, you've got some potential, but we're just not sure yet. We want you to do some more teaching, some more preaching. Or if the elders are going, the time is clicking. God has really got his hand on you. Then hopefully those elders in that church would say, and we're willing to help you. Mm -hmm. We're we're here to support you. We're not just going to ship you off to wherever, you know, as you go to PRTS or as you go RBS, we're going to be supporting you through this. And it's not just this man's received a call and they just said, well, we'll pray for you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there is a place for caution. It's not just this man, I'm on fire and I need to go do this. I really, I really am resonating with what you're saying about elders because um, in my personal experience, I mean, you're, you're given a, a big weight of responsibility and um, how would I say it? Not just responsibility, but um, authority to these men. Like they have a huge say in what is going on here. Where I think this there there can be this view where there's that there's that senior pastor, the senior pastor, mm -hmm. who um, kind of you know is at the top of the food chain, as it were. Mm -hmm. So that's on the one end is the senior pastor, but on the other end is like the young the young man who um, is perhaps discerning, as we call it, discerning a call to the ministry. But the way you're describing it, it's not like that that young man should just do it all himself. Like, right. I'm going to apply to a seminary. Right. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that without any kind of outside input. And I, so can you talk more? Because uh, you're, really, you're really presenting more of an elevated view of eldership that mm -hmm. I haven't heard as much. Right. Yeah, well, too, I also realize that when we speak about these things, we're always speaking from our own church's polity. So I realize there's some in the Reformed world that apparently see distinctions between like the minister and the elders or maybe pastor and elders. Where in, our, in most of our churches, if not all of them, from at least most of them, um, we see elder, pastor as, as one in the same office. Bishop, overseer, pastor, they're different words for the same office. We believe in a plurality of elders when it's possible. So you don't, you know, when it's possible, sometimes a church just has one elder, there's no one else qualified, and, and there's no one else to come. Um, they don't all have to be full-time, but a multiplicity of elders. We also believe in parity. There's not a top dog at the top who's not under accountability, right? Now, you may have different levels of influence and maybe job descriptions or areas of focus, but there's not one guy that's just, you know, you know calling the shots and everybody has to obey that they're all under equally they're e under each other's oversight. I have there are five elders in my church right now. They're all my pastors. Right? I'm submissive to them. They're submissive to me. And then we believe in diversity. Again, what I just said, that doesn't mean we're cookie cutter replicas. You may have someone that does most of the preaching, someone who does most of the counseling or whatever, but there's conferral and there's and so that's that's part of our our um that that's our polity and how it, how it works. Sure. I guess what I'm getting at is that 
let's take an example. You've you've got a young man in your church mm-hmm. who has ex- he's not on staff. Mm-hmm. He's he's not um, he's not an elder, right. and uh, he. So there, there could be two kind of scenarios, and this is where I, I think we're getting to this main issue of authority. So John von Volandowski was here. Yeah, the other day. My fellow elder, John Volandowski. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And so um, we talked a lot about authority, mm-hmm. although that was more in the context of the household, mm-hmm. um, but also in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, as you know, there's quite a lot of integration there within the Christian faith. But the, so if you could have two different scenarios play out one is where there's a young man who has this very strong desire to go mm-hmm. go to seminary and start mm-hmm. that that path and the elders say nah mm-hmm. it's not right time for you buddy right. or another guy who's like a bit maybe cautious hesitant he's mm-hmm. got the good job and the elders are like you need to go man like right. it's time for you that's putting a huge amount of responsibility on uh not the individual agency of the young exactly. man, right. but this body of other men right. who are sinners too, you know, mm-hmm. saved by grace. Right. But I'm just trying to think here, think as I talk about the implications. I mean, I think for myself, I, if I, I mean, I was given the green light, but I know that there was a strong part of me too that really wanted it. Mm-hmm. I really right. wanted to go to seminary. I really wanted to learn the languages and mm-hmm. get into the study and right. and get into the pulpit, you know. So I'm trying to think, what would I have done if if the elders at my church had been like, "It's not time for you, Tavis. You need to hang on." Right. That would have been really hard for me. Right. Yeah, and, and this, I do believe the issue of authority is huge with this because. You know, if a if a young man in our church says, "Well, you know, I, I believe I am called to disagree, so I'm going to leave and go to seminary." Obviously, we're not going to discipline him, but you will, you know. But I, I do believe that it is proper and right to submit to that counsel and follow that authority in those mm-hmm. moments, because if you have an eldership, if it was just one man, an elder, then then maybe wisely you, you're being questioned by the young man. And so you say, okay, well, let's bring in some other guys from other places, whatever. Maybe older, other men in the church that are not elders, but they're trusted, the deacons. But if you have four or five men that have a track record of being faithful men, they don't have some kind of secret agenda, and you're hearing this counsel. I mean, what does the Proverbs say about listening to counsel? What does it say about the person who separates himself and he has his own agenda, Proverbs 18? He just wants to be heard. He doesn't. He doesn't want anyone to rain on his parade. And when you find that kind of young man, that scares me because I'm mm. thinking, I don't want that guy to be in the... i really very concerned that he go into ministry until maybe he matures and that, that, that edginess gets off of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, because what if he's going to be on an eldership, is he going to be a team player? Or is he going to be the guy that says, no, I know this is right, gentlemen, and, you know... <laughs> is he? That's a testing ground already for the eldership. Is right. he going to listen? Right. Um, and so I think that's very important. So, yeah, I, I am very heavy on not just the eldership, but the church's uh, view of the man. Mm-hmm. And if you're getting feedback and people are going, you know, Johnny really thinks he's, you know, all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> you know, but I've the people. So, I've got someone in my head right now. The, and, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and, you're, and the people are going, nope. no, 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 nope. no, no, no. He's a good guy. But. Or he's gifted, but look at his family. His family's disarray. Mm. Look at his poor mm. wife. I mean, he's out going into ministry stuff every every week, but his wife's falling apart with the kids. Right. You know. You right. it, so you've got to listen to that. And I think you're if you have an elder, if you have men that that have a proven track record, and they're telling you go, yeah, man, we've got your, we're going to help you. You know, or they're saying not yet. Then you're not. You're going to be the better for it. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that helped me, uh, and I had uh, a man that I was under for several years, and then eventually another man came on board when I was in South Carolina on the board on the eldership that I was under before I was an elder there, and even after I was an elder, that were good men, and they helped guide and direct, and I'm grateful for it. But even in the midst of all that, and I'm not saying this is a brag, but I think anybody that wants to be in the ministry needs to believe in the sovereignty of God. Mm. I knew the Lord had my phone number. He knew my address, my email, whatever. And when he was good and ready, 
there's not enough men on the planet that could keep me from the ministry. Mm. Mm. Do you really believe that the God who sent Moses on the backside of the desert for 40 years would in his time bring Moses out of that? I'm, not that I'm Moses or you're Moses, but the, but the paradigm. I've often thought how, many, how, how hard it was maybe for Moses of those 40 years because he had this sense that he was going to be the deliverer. Mm-hmm. Remember in Acts, he kills yeah. the guy, and, he, yeah. and he's tending sheep for 40 years. Imagine getting up every day tending sheep and you, and you know your people are suffering back over here. Hmm. You have to trust the Lord's time. And I think a young man or whatever age has to believe the Lord Jesus is head of his church. And when I stand in that pulpit the first time, I want to know that he put me there. I didn't campaign. I didn't twist things. I didn't manipulate. I didn't name drop. I didn't, you know, um, but that, I followed the biblical process because the biblical process laid out, and we didn't even go through it all yet or talk about it. We don't necessarily have to, but the Lord has to sovereignly bring all those pieces together. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not foolproof. You can end up with a Judas, right? But, but it's really hard to make all those pieces come together if you're just trusting the Lord. Yeah. And that there's nothing like that because, you know, if, if a group of people don't want me to be their pastor, guess what? I don't want to be their pastor, <laughs> right? What well, kind of, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. because that's ultimately, you got to have a group of people that want you to be their pastor and men who want to lay their hands on you. Yeah. And I never, I don't want to feel like at all that I tricked them into doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who would, I mean, I, I love the pastoral ministry is rewarding, but it's really hard. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm, so I'm not dissing the ministry. I'm just saying when times get tough, you've got to be able to know the Lord put me here. Yeah, and, and what and, you're saying about the elders too is um, if you've got those men behind you, mm-hmm. like they've got your back in either case. Right. If you're not ready or you, you need to go, right? you know, they're behind you. So that there's that, not just a sense of accountability, but support as well for when things get really hard. Mm-hmm. How would, <laughs> I would like to actually to get into the biblical mm-hmm. uh, case as, as mm-hmm. you said it, but... Um, how how do you think you've grown as an elder since? Well, gosh, I don't know. Where where would you start with that? Since since you stepped away, f- you know, yeah. you became a lay elder during the ten years at the end in of the, the wilderness, wilderness. About ten years later, yeah. right? Uh, how would you say that you've grown as an elder? Because I'm sure you've seen v- very good and very bad examples of of men well, in the eldership. I would. I've been privileged to work with good men in the eldership uh, over the years, and uh, not that there haven't been problems, um, or not that there hasn't been any kind of uh, reason to step down. I have been in on staff where elders have had to step down, and then even later something get revealed or something happen after that mm-hmm. the scandal. So it's not. I'm not. But God is privileged overall. But I'm not even saying, you know, and those have turned out in, in repentance and, and so on. But overall, it's been, it's been a good ride as far as being around men, good men. So when I stepped away from the Southern Baptist circles and stepped down from the ministry, that was in March of 96. Uh, I stepped away two days before my 21st birthday. And then in November 2005, I was ordained as a non-vocational elder in the church in Eastleigh, South Carolina, where I was at, the Reformed Baptist Church. And about six months after that or so, um, I filled in for, I I left my normal, regular work to fill in for one of our pastors as he was completing his PhD. And that went on for about 10 months. And then after that, won't go into all the details. I ended up coming here for like a six month, ended up being like a six month get to know period before they ordained me. And so as far as growing as an elder, I mean, um, it's very helpful when you're able to work with men who have more experience than you do. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. I mean, yeah, obviously that can be frustrating at times when you're a younger man because we need to do this, we need to do that. But, But even that's good for you. Even if you are right, it's good to have to be in a situation, even now, where if you think, I think this is what we should do, you're thinking, why can't you see that? Well, even if, that can be pride, but even when it's not, you're, you're outnumbered. And it's good to have to submit, even if you think you're right. 
And then later on, you might realize, thankfully, they didn't take my suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe, maybe you are thinking. A man could think, well, he should have listened to me, you know. But it's good to have to submit to that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a real test of humility. And, you know, you have to do private repentance in your own heart at times when you get frustrated um, or confess it to your fellow elder. Um, but it's, I think one of the things about an eldership is just, especially if you have true parity, there's that, you learn a lot about the relational dynamics of that kind of relationship of having to, you don't always get your way. Your view doesn't always win. You have to realize it's very humbling. I heard a, a, a man that used to be my pastor in South Carolina, and I've labored with him for a little bit, and we're still good friends, and, and we labor together in seminary work and so on. Um, he said one of the things about the pl- a plurality of elders is that you learn what your weaknesses are too because, you know, uh, you say if we're working together as elders, I might say, well, Tavis, man, he's really just – you know, he's really on the details, and he, and he knows, and I don't, and I can see that now. I, I'm not as good at that. Oh, and you would learn the same thing, and that you learn your weaknesses, and you learn your strengths. And so you, you grow that way when you realize. Like one thing that I'm, I've realized, especially in the last few years, is, and this is not so much necessarily a weakness, but it's an area the Lord may not have gifted me in, is I'm not fast on my feet, right? Um especially if it's a context like this where we're just talking, that's fine. We can kind of ad lib or redirect it if it's not going so well. But but if this was an intense conversation and you said, Jeff, I need to talk to you about something, and it's this big elaborate thing, I'm just not fast piecing it all together. I have to go back way and think about it and piece it together and ponder it. And, and uh, whereas you maybe have another elder, and I haven't, like John, Rondolowski, he's faster on his feet than I am. Well, that's a good compliment to one another mm-hmm. because he can maybe speak to something faster than I can. Well, then maybe I'm like, whoa, you know, whoa, Nelly, slow up the cart. <laughs> and that can, you know, help him not be so fast. And so you just, there, that you, you just grow in that a lot. Just those relational dynamics. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just huge, you know. Speaking of the uh, strengths and weaknesses, was it, Early on, that you discerned um, a proclivity to preaching as kind of okay. This is something that maybe I enjoy doing. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm competent at it, and mm-hmm. I'm getting better each time. Or, you know, how did that process come about? Well, it, it, in the circles I grew up in, and I don't know how much this is still true or not, but the Southern Baptist context I grew up in. Because of the direct revelation view of the call, it was not uncommon for young teenage boys to receive the call to preach. Now, of course, that didn't mean they went out and got it. They didn't go out and get a church, but even be given opportunities at certain times. Maybe it was a youth night on a Sunday night, and you'd get to preach, or the pastor would let you have the pulpit occasionally on a Wednesday night or Sunday night or something. Very foreign to what I'm in now. But it Do was, you have videos of that time? Uh, <clears throat> Well, let's just say you'd have to pay big money to, <laughs> to to watch that, you know. Yeah, I do have some videos tucked away, but we'll just we'll, right, we'll keep right. them there. Abby, we'll, can you Google search those? <laughs> <laughs> They're not on Google, thankfully. Oh, um, shame. So, but I say that that I actually started doing that before I was truly converted. That's part of my story. And uh, but even before I was, and this is not a brag because if you went back and if you were to go back and look at those videos hopefully compared to what I do now, preaching-wise, skill-wise, you would see a big difference, I would hope. But I had some ability right off the bat to speak publicly. And, of course, that's why it's not good to give a young man opportunity to speak publicly because mm-hmm. then your head can't fit into the headphones because they get, your head gets filled with pride. And, and I wasn't converted to, so that was not a good mixture. But I, I say that I had some ability to, sp- to speak publicly. I had good models too, as far as actual skill uh, to emulate and and so on, and I could expand, you know. So, so from the get go, I always wanted to preach, and um, but over time, once I especially when I became reformed, I really began to realize the importance of it's pastoring's more than preaching. You know, you've got to 
get into the sh- to the uh, to the ditch with the people who've fallen. You've got to there's good amount of administrative work. Even doing what you do, I mean, you love doing this, but how many times are you sp- just pushing paper trying to get things ready, and you're like, man, I'd really rather be. Done. <laughs> so pastoring <laughs> is a lot of administrative too, and just keeping yeah. the ball rolling. And yeah. so I've had to grow in those things. But yeah, but preaching has always been the primary focal point of my own heart and desire. Um, I feel that's what I love the most. I feel like I'm not saying I'm a great preacher, but of all the pastoral skills that I have, that's I would say that's the main skill mm-hmm. that I have. I've seen you preach a number of times. Yeah, you've been to our church. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you bring that. You bring that southern flavor, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I've wanted to see, and this is not. I'm is not that trying intentional, to, or this is you. Well, it's it's both because it's I, I grew up in that context. I, I don't know too much about the Dutch right. Reformed preaching style, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it doesn't strike me as that they're the same. No, they're not the same. No, they're not. And and so I part of it is just because I grew up in that culture. It's just the way people are. Um, so I grew up where, um, looking back, and this is not a put down, it's just a fact, at least, at least from my point of view, is that you, you don't have a lot of good, solid doctrine in, in those contexts. You do some, but uh, maybe some of the most basic features of the gospel, but it still tends toward an easy believism. And But you will find some preachers in those contexts that are very skilled, holding your attention, mm-hmm. animated, move around. It's not just, you know, the talking head, you know. And so... There was a particular man that I used to follow around who who for some years was an itinerant preacher, what we'd call an evangelist in those circles, yeah. and when he was in town, and I would just be mesmerized. And I, I don't know that I could have articulated it then, what I'm saying now, but I realized at that time it wasn't just what he said, it was how he said it. Mm-hmm. And I picked up on that it's not just the content. You can have wonderful content in a sermon, and people can't wait till it's over. But there's also, and I don't want to call it entertainment value because that would be, <laughs> but there is an element of the aesthetic of drawing someone in, keeping them interested, uh, you know, memorable phrases, uh, different things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know this could be controversial, but injection of judicious humor when mm-hmm. it's appropriate, that mm-hmm. it might fit the point you're making. And, it's, yeah. and it kind of, ah, you know, people. Um, and so... Uh, so that's, and a lot of that's Southern and it's not just in preaching, but Southern folks are just, you know, they, they, they use expressions and, uh, that are just unique to them mm-hmm. and that'll mm-hmm. show up in the, in the preaching of the word. And what's your preparation like? Well, it's gotten faster through the years. Is that out of necessity or just, you've just gotten to some necessity, quicker. but just quicker because, um, you just learn to, one of the things I learned a few years ago was even if you have to spend extra time getting a good outline, it's worth it because once you've got a good outline, and I alliterate all my stuff. That's and, very obvious by the way you... Yeah, the, the book is Table of contents of your book. <laughs> <laughs> so We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, but, it, it, uh, but doing that, I enjoy that. I think it helps people, but it also just the discipline of having to do that makes it easier than you've got the skeleton that you can then fill out, you know, where you're going. Mm-hmm. And so that's helped because if you start with a sermon and you'll go, I'll just do the outline as I go, you can just be all over the place. So I, mm-hmm. I hope that therefore I've become clearer through the years. Let me ask you a question about, about this, because I know from my experience preaching, so all through my postgraduate work in England, mm-hmm. I was, Doing, we call it like pulpit fill or mm-hmm. helping out at the churches I, we were at and preaching every so mm-hmm. often. And um, one thing that's always frustrated me is, as someone who's really enjoyed reading deeply into theology mm-hmm. and uh, as you know the biblical scholarship that I was doing for my postgraduate mm-hmm. work, I I wanted to put that stuff in. Right. I wanted the people to know. Right. I wanted yeah. to not just go to applicate, hey, this is how you, you can apply this right. passage, but I wanted to take people deep, but it's it was it's so hard. It's right. so hard to find that balance to where right. could my kids sit through this and get something right and not just like 
professor, doctor, whoever sitting in the audience is like, oh yeah, tracking with you. So um, I guess where I'm going with this is like, it's, you are within a tradition, Reformed Baptist, 1689, I almost said 69, 1689 Confession, you've got this rich history of catechism, Mm -hmm. creed, and so forth, you know, church history, Um, but you've only got an hour on once a week. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming you probably maybe preach a few other times during the week, but it's just not a lot of time. So mm-hmm. how, how, how do you deal with that, um, that challenge to find a balance? Yeah. I, I would say I hope that I have, with clarity, I've become a simpler preacher through the years in that my points are not these long puritanical <laughs> Exercitation of the, you know, oh, like the title is right, of the title, right, or whatever, yeah. of a point or whatever. So I've tried to make that simple, and then I've realized if if I need to ex- explain what that point is, I can okay. do that and then get into it. So I just say that as an example, right, to yeah. try to be simple in that way. But I don't ever want to be. I never want to be simplistic. Okay, because simplistic so that's is the difference. simple is you try to make it clear. Okay, simplistic is you try to remove all the difficulties so it's clear. Well, then you end up with something less than the truth. Just mm-hmm. like when Paul, Paul Peter said, some things Paul wrote, wrote hard to understand. It's hard. Mm-hmm. There, some of those things are hard to understand. Mm-hmm. And that passage, I don't think he's talking about Paul's style. I think he's talking about some of the some of the things he addresses are hard to understand. Meaning, there's some things in Scripture that are hard to understand. And it's just like the statement that um, Dr. Sam Waldron uh, says, and I, I guess it's original with him. But when he talks about the clarity of Scripture, that's one of its attributes. Uh, uh, you know, Scripture is clear. Scripture is not equally clear to all, and not all parts of Scripture are equally clear. Mm-hmm. And and so the the point is is that there are just some things that are hard, and so I feel your pain. I, I, I wrestle with that myself because how you know are there some subjects that might be best for an, a, a a teaching setting that's not in the pulpit because it's so detailed. Possibly, right? Because you, you, you need some give and take and questions. It's harder to do when you're <laughs> preaching in a pulpit. Yeah. But I do think we should try to push the envelope with people and not just all, you know, in other words, I'm not saying just give them milk. You got to give them some meat. But you've got kids sitting in there too. Right. I've been to your church and right. you've got young kids sitting there. And I also, and... Th- I also think that the, the, uh, to say it kind of bluntly, the people in the pew can't say, listen, you got 20 minutes. You know, and there can be the thought, well, if you can't say it in 20 minutes, then you really maybe don't know your subject. Can't be clear. I just disagree with that. Mm-hmm. I also think you can't put everything on the preacher. So if you say something and you didn't quite understand that sermon, get the CD or do the download and listen to it five times. If you don't go to your pastor and say, can we have coffee? Let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. Be the student. Mm-hmm. If your kids go, Dad, I was uh, in my happy place for about 30 minutes because I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> And sit at the table and say, so he talked about eschatology. Let's think about that word. You know, so it can't, I th- I'm afraid it's almost like, okay, I'm sitting here now, bless me. Right. Help me. And if you mm-hmm. can't do the whole, you're, you're not the only one working. And I think that's where we have to get, get the people. Because I do think there are some things that are hard that we need to preach, mm-hmm. that we need to try to do it. I always, I do a lot of my sermons in very, even when I'm doing consecutive exposition, very bite-sized nuggets so that I have time to explain and apply without doing 10 verses at once and then trying to, you know. When you say bite side nuggets, you mean on any given Sunday you're, you're doing nuggets throughout that single sermon or you're breaking up a text? I'm making them a text. So like, uh-huh. you know, this, this past Lord's, I'm making my way through Philippians on Sunday morning. So uh, last week I dealt with, uh, I believe it was the first part of verse 27 of chapter 1. And then I dealt with the rest of the text through the end of the chapter, verse 30, on this, this past Sunday. It was the Sunday before and then this past Sunday. And I take on just enough that I can explain well and yet still apply practically. And sometimes when you're preaching on a subject, you know, say you're going to preach on the return of Christ, mm-hmm. you know, well, then I don't have a problem with that's 25 sermons long. Why? You're taking piece by piece. 
Well, if someone says, yeah, but by the 17th sermon, we don't even remember what, well, then you've got work to do. Go to your notes. Go to your notes. <laughs> Go back and listen. So you're putting some of that responsibility yeah. on the people as well. Right. What do we call, so I actually went to Master Seminary, mm -hmm. and I remember John MacArthur. Well, I grew up at Grace Church, too. Right. And I remember John would, I remember one specific instance, he spent two or three Sundays on, I think, the first four words of a verse right. in Romans. Right. And I, I, can't, I can't even recall the reference, but I just it was so memorable to me that it was that important to him. Right. But there was a term that they used when, when, we were, when I was there at seminary was exegetical listening. Mm -hmm. So it's not just you up there and it's all the weights on the pastor. Right. And then just let, let it fall where it may. Exactly. As someone sitting there in the pews, you have a responsibility as well, not just to imbibe it all, but also have some discernment too. I mean, mm -hmm. are there times that congregants have come up to you and said, hey, Jeff, you said something here, and I'm not sure that that's right. I've had that happen, yeah, not yeah. all the time, but I've had that happen for sure, and then you can have that conversation. Or maybe the way you express this yeah, it was didn't unclear. Come, or, or, you or know, stuff understand. like that. Yeah, you're going to have that, which can be good, you know, and yeah. uh, uh, and or you may have the experience like they give you an insight to the text you didn't have. Mm hmm you're like, man, I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> but but it's helpful. <laughs> but I like that because I don't mind if I'm, say if I'm preaching, you're sitting in the congregation and you said, man, that was a good sermon, but halfway you said this thing, I started cross-referencing. Mm -hmm. And I missed the rest of it. Man, I got, I, I'm okay. You're thinking. You're, you know, it's, prime. I think preaching's like priming the pump. Or I've expressed it this way before. What do, what do you mean priming what pump? It, it gets you going. It's not, it doesn't do okay. all the work for you. Mm-hmm. So I've explained it this way before, like, do you have a spiritual grapefruit diet? So let's just say you go on a grapefruit diet for a while, for a long time, and then you go out and eat a bunch of pizza. You may get sick. Mm -hmm. Your body could go in shock. So I think sometimes people have such, maybe, some people maybe have such little appetite in private that it's overload. on. If you go for 30 minutes, it's overload for them. But it's because they're not hungering and thirsting in their own private lives. Mm -hmm. It's good to challenge. I think people in the pew ought to be challenged to, okay, pick up Bovinks uh, or Louis Burkhoff and start making your way through. And if you don't understand the word, go look it up. Go ask a question. Stretching yourself beyond just devotional material. Because um, I find actually that I am the most blessed when I read deep theology and, mm -hmm. and dealing with issues Probably because it it forces me to pay attention because I don't pay attention very easily. Mm -hmm. So actually having to deal with something that's more involved makes me contemplate it more than just a. I'm not against devotional material, but I I, I don't it doesn't because it's not designed necessarily to make you think deeply as much mm -hmm. as it's more let's just reflect and but that makes me have to do that. So I think you have to challenge people. Hey, why don't you pick this up and try to make your way through it and learn it. Mm -hmm. And realize the mm -hmm. implications mm -hmm. of these things, and then that then when yeah. you hear it preach, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm tracking with you better. Mm. So, kind of going back to how I opened up this little discussion is, um, well, you talked about your time, so you've gotten quicker and better at mm -hmm. at preparing sermons and less time, and I could see that, for example, the the pastors that are going to listen to this thinking okay, when I get to that point, or maybe I've gotten to that point where I'm more efficient, mm -hmm. I don't need to spend 35 hours a week preparing my sermon. So now you've got more time. Mm -hmm. How do you decide how to use that time? Because you could make a case that, well, it's still my sermon prep time because mm -hmm. I've set it aside for that, but I don't need 30 hours anymore. Now I just can do it in 20. Mm -hmm. So now you've got this you know, 10 hours mm -hmm. to use. Do you give that to family? Do you find a hobby? Mm -hmm. Do you do visitation ministry? Mm -hmm. Or, just going right back to what we were talking about, do you start reading deeper, richer theology? Do you read Baving? Do you mm -hmm. read, uh, start making your way through all of John Owen? You know, do you start reading mm -hmm. the Church Fathers? Do you start to like enrich your understanding? However, now you've got all this material in addition to how you normally prepared are you following me here? Where it's like, how do you bring all this new richness into your sermons without mm -hmm. overwhelming, making your people 
a bit mm -hmm. distressed. Right. You know, as far as what you do with the time now that that you have that you were formally spending preparing, and part of it gets faster too because I've heard it explained this way, and I think it's true. You have less things to work out in your mind as you're preparing. Mm -hmm. Because you end up, even with the consecutive exposition, over time you end up saying some of the same things over again, just naturally through the text. Especially as doing expository. Right, preaching. you end up with You're so that, Philippians, so, so that you don't you don't have to like rework that doctrine in your own heart or that mm -hmm. thought. So you not that you're saying the same thing you said in the last sermon, but that so you just there's not a, a lot of things you know already just being in the ministry, and so you're able to flesh it out more quickly. So that that's just over build up over time. You know, just like any job, you just get more efficient because you're used to the material and you know what to do and you don't have to spend as much time contemplating what to do next. Mm -hmm. So what you do with that time depends on what your tasks are as an elder. You know, like if you're a single elder and your church is growing, then you're going to have just a, I mean, you've got that more time now to administrate, counsel, get things ready for Sunday. Um, you know, but it all depends on if you have other elders um, maybe you now have, and this has happened to me in the last few years, more outside ministry opportunities you've got to prepare for. Um, I'm going to Columbia uh, for the second time in February of this coming year. So I've got lectures for pastoral theology to prepare. Mm -hmm. And time is it's July, but February, February will be here tomorrow. In yeah. other words, I've got to economize. I've got to make sure that I have that. I can send it down and get translated and for the, you know, whatever. So, and then a, a, a module I'm probably going to teach here on call and cultivation redo, and I'll do the whole thing. So I've got some of that already prepared. Well, I've got most of that. Well, I have the course prepared, but I have to redo some things. So I got to get that. And then I go to uh, Zambia at the end of 2024 to teach 15 lectures that have not been prepared yet. So that will fill some of the time up. The elders said that I can spend some time writing. Mm -hmm. to, for publication. Mm -hmm. Now that's a little bit lower on the totem pole because I, I, I can't justify taking too much time away from my pastoral responsibilities, but mm -hmm. that's something that they've said, mm -hmm. yeah, you can, you know, you can do that. They're, they yeah. don't, they want me doing it 50 hours a week, Yeah, but I can, I can do that. So I've had other out. So for me, I have more outside opportunities, conferences or different things. I'm not, a, I'm not a big conference speaker, but just smaller things, mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. you know, that whatever, and and then meeting with people, counseling. Um, I'm the the um, the chairman of the elder board. I don't have more authority, but I I run the elders meetings. I get the stuff together. I keep kind of things going through the week, administrating. You know, so just that kind of stuff. You know how it is. Any job, the the time ticks off pretty fast. And yeah. then Sunday's here. Yeah. And at some point in the week, you got to prepare. And then you got all day Sunday. And, you know, like this past Sunday, by the Sunday night, because we had a meeting after church, we stayed at church all day, had a meeting during Sunday school with, with someone that needed, some people needed to help. And then we had, after we stayed and ate at lunch Sunday, I had a meeting for our youth retreat coming up in December. And then I preached twice, and then we had a church meeting afterwards. I was fried. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, you you know it's like packing two days in one almost. It feels. So my point is, is you're, if you're, Depending on your responsibilities, that time can get filled mm -hmm. up. I'd like to actually, I, I've always thought this, that I would like to get to the place eventually where I could once in a while have a couple days where I could just read mm. to fill that well up. Amen. I and, feel the same thing. And, the, yeah. the, the, and I'm what, not even in the ministry. Well, the, that um, I preach about 67% of our total preaching mm -hmm. schedule. Which means I preach almost every Sunday morning unless I'm a, I'm gone or mm -hmm. some special thing, and a good number of Sunday nights through the year, but not all of them because we have other people preach too. So the way the the elder who keeps the schedule is starting to schedule it is he's starting to try to schedule me in packs of time, so that like in August I don't preach at all. Mm -hmm. I'll have a vacation week, and that way I can focus on some other things. So I'm hoping as that continues, that's kind of a new thing. That I can say, you know, this week I'm just going to read a lot, you know, and just fill my own soul and fill my mind, and you know, I think that's healthy because it, that's it's actually harder to do than maybe some people realize. Maybe some pastors are better at it, but mm. I'm not. <laughs> so at, I want to try to time to read. Read, yeah, yeah. because it's. Uh, uh, 
I, I think it's kind of hard for me to read a lot at one time. Mm-hmm. It's just the way I am. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to do that more and just say, hey, I'd like to read John Owen on communion with God. Or, or here's this book that I got about years ago and I haven't read it yet. Because mm-hmm. I'm bad about starting books and not completing them. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, because my interest, you know, oh, I'll do this. Oh, that sounds good, you know. So I think that I'd like to do that. Yeah. But if you're... Or other things, as far as filling up your time, maybe there's more evangelistic opportunities you can, mm-hmm. you can, uh, you can maybe be a part of or help mm-hmm. get started. Or there's always something that you can be doing. I once he- heard a man tell me that ministry is like a big black hole. There's always more to do, and I would say there's always more to do better. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you're committed to all your tasks, you won't you won't run out of stuff to do. <laughs> would you say that that's the hardest part about being a pastor is having all your time taken. Well, it's it, it it's it's once you're in the ministry, um, you, you, well, I don't ever want to come across to to Bob, who's uh, let's say he's um, uh, pick a job. You know, he he works in this factory over here, and he's and he's maybe a manager of this factory. I never want to come across to him like, well, you ought to be in the ministry, then you really know what stress is. I think we've got to be careful with that because it okay. can make people feel like, you know. On the other hand, I've worked in other fields, yeah, and there is nothing like being a pastor. I mean, it's a great privilege, but it is a constant pressure. Mm-hmm. And that pressure goes up and down depending on the state of your church or how things are going, and that's, that's always, that's up and down. Read the New Testament. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there are ups and downs, joys and hard, hardships. But it really is hard to turn it off. Uh, twenty twenty one, I was blessed to have a three month sabbatical, May, June, and July of twenty twenty one, and it was needed. I, I could have taken longer. And that's not a complaint. I'm just saying I could have, <laughs> I could have taken longer. Uh, and we decided after that that every seven years, every full time man will get a three month sabbatical. Mm-hmm. And then we've tried to work it out to where even our lay elders, our non vocational men, can take some time off. That was very good, and I think it's it, it's. I, I was able to unplug. Uh, I was able to work on the, the book because I was able to do whatever I wanted to. I didn't want to just sit around and just play golf or whatever. I wanted to. I was able to rest too. But I find that to me that I like writing. That's fun. Yeah. That's fun. It wasn't like oh, I've got to get this done. It was my own right. personal project. Yeah. Right. It wasn't like Grace Emanuel's going. Hey, you got it. You know. So. Um, but yeah, the, the, one of the hardest things about the ministry is it does take a toll on you. It'll mm-hmm. make an old man out of you mm-hmm. uh, because of the waves and currents of just, you just, there's just something all the time. And that's not a put down. I mean, what a privilege it is. But there's, you know, even when things are going good, it's not long before, okay, well, this situation's going to blow up or this person's yeah. really on the yeah. brink. And you, over a while, after a while, it, it can wear on you. You know, and I think a man. That's why I do think that's what can play into retirement, a legitimate for a pastor at a certain point, because you get to the point where physically and emotionally you just don't have the stamina to do it. I, I, I heard uh, there was a well-known pastor in circles that retired several many years ago, several years ago now. But one of his fellow elders was telling me that before he retired, he would come into the elders' meeting, you know, and he'd talk, he'd be, you know, and he says by the end he'd just be kind of slumped in his seat, you know. <laughs> And I know the feeling, you know, because it's yeah. like, uh, there's just, it's just hard to disconnect. And now with cell phones, people can get to you anytime. And I think that's increased email, cell phone. You can be on vacation, get a text, or, mm-hmm. and it's hard not to call in, you know, hey, what's going on? <laughs> Let's use that as a segue because I do want to talk about your right. book. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a perfect point to transition over. So for those, uh, watching the video. This is Jeff's book, Taming the Fingers. Excellent little volume, by the way. Um, and I like the table of contents, sort of like a preacher's dream. Yeah. <laughs> um, you organize it all by C's. Am I controlled? Am I calm? Am I careful? Am I compassionate? Am I conscientious? And then conclusion. Mm-hmm. See? Another I, C. Didn't, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Like, <laughs> um yeah, I well here's the question here's the question that's kind of dominated my thinking after going through your book is should 
Christians even be on social media? Because you and I were about the same age, and I grew up um, when there were still phones connected to cords on the wall, Yeah, and you'd have to come home after the long day and press the button on the voicemail. There'd be a, a number there, and the old analog or digital or digits, right? A three or a six or however many people called you that day. And, um, but once you walked out of that room that no one could really access you. Right. Except, right. you know, neighbor kid comes over, wants to play. Um, now, you know, we've kept smartphones from our kids for now. Um, they've, we told them they got to be 18, but mm -hmm. you know, all their friends, like you see them out um, by the supermarket where we live, they're all sitting in a circle, just each on their own phone. Right. So that's kind of where my where my question is is, um, I mean, I have my opinions on this, but mm -hmm. but should Christians even be utilizing what you describe as a a tool, mm -hmm. this yeah. particular tool that has potential for a lot of damage. Yeah, I, you know, I, as I say in the book, I, I don't take the position that it's evil or wrong, um, because in 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 and of itself, in and of itself, social media is not it's not evil right. So Christians or, must just right, yeah, right, um, because it's more of a hard issue of how you handle it. Because you can, the tendency to 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 distance ourselves from these things without thinking about it, we can just express the same thing in a different problem, like. I mean, I'm never on social media, yeah, but you're watching five hours of TV a night. You're right. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, uh, my point but is, can't is you that, just go Amish about it? Right. Yeah, like, right that's my it. point. My point is, yeah. So my point is, is that the answer isn't, let's just do away with social media though. I'm very tempted to say, I think we had a better world without it. I mean, I'm, yeah, really, I'm, I, I, I know, I'm, and I'm on it. So I'm not saying like, yeah. you know, I, I, but I have I, those dreams sometimes. I just want to move to a cabin with my family and get away from this stuff. So I, I think it's, uh, and I don't really deal with this in the book, but I don't know how social it is. Hmm. Explain that. Well, you just said, okay, and this is, I know, and I, you know, I'm guilty of it too, but it's, 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 how you doing? Yeah, you know, but we're, you know, and so you're talking about these kids are not even talking to each other maybe, but they're all on the social media if, if that's what they're doing or whatever. They're just texting other kids. Yeah. And so it's is that about, really social? This... I think we, we can lose our skills of, of, of true social interaction. I think it can be a good tool that, um, hey, I posted about our, my anniversary today and put a little song for my wife or whatever. And, and so I try to, for me, I've limited it mainly. I have said some spiritual things on there once in a while or posted some, but but uh, I haven't done that in a long time, and I don't know if I ever will again. You know, I've, uh, maybe I will, but I just I just try to use it for its Facebook. Hey, we had a nice vacation. Or, hey, Jacob was, was in this play or in there he won the game or you know so i just use it for those general social things and it's going to be a blessing because you can connect with people that you used to had to you had to write to and they wouldn't get it for a week and then you don't know what's going on with them so family you can keep up with them and send messages so there are many wonderful opportunities but it has a lot of drawbacks mm -hmm. and one way i think that that it that it can create a context where we're not as social Mm. Because it, you know, you and I grew up, you know, late seventies, eighties, ninety, you know, where there was more of a neighborhood. The kids came over and played. Some of that. I mean, I'm not saying that doesn't go on now, but it was. That's how you interacted. You know, hey, come over, let's play Atari. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, for those of you who want to know what that is, you know, um, I actually saw an old Atari in a, in a, in a museum once. I, that, that made me. That was a kind of a, well. I you can. We had Nintendo, the first one. We had I had Nintendo, Super Remember Mario. That? Like, yeah. Oh yeah, Super Mario. Oh man, that's the, that's the, that's, the that's game out. where you shoot the ducks. Yes, yeah, uh, Mario Brothers and all the original that. Zelda. And uh, See, I'm getting nostalgic. Now. Yeah, that's it, man. Let's, <laughs> let's go play. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, it it's it's definitely our world has changed in that regard. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, but what so what was the impetus behind writing Taming the Fingers? Then, like, what drove you to feel like? You needed to, well, as a pastor, tell mm -hmm. people s something about social media maybe they haven't heard before. Well, it, it, I, it's not a book, and as you've read it, it really doesn't get into statistics or how much time people waste or these kind of things. And you, you could do that, but then that takes a lot more research. And 
in terms of publishers too, then they got to be careful with is this correct or accurate. And so I decided, you know, I want this to be a very just practical, script rich in scripture. And it really was based on some messages I preached to our congregation that I ended up editing and adding to and taking from or whatever. And because it was during the time of COVID and with George Floyd situation, Facebook just, at least mine, lit up with, mm-hmm. you know, there were just a few opinions about those things. Yeah. <laughs> just a few, right? Yeah. Well, you should have seen Twitter then. And it was just, <laughs> and so it was just kind of the point of where even with Christians, you're going, man, there's just such a attitude and, hmm. you know, a, a, a pride and an arrogance and a, the things that could hurt others that are just unnecessary. And so I, I, we had addressed the congregation about that because we had our own issues with it. And I thought, well, this would be a good, this would make a good book that would be helpful. Because I say in the book, as you know, I don't think it's wrong to use social media to address things politically or say or preach the gospel or share things. I'm just not, how, I'm just not sure how effective it is at those yeah. things yeah. because of the quickness of it. Mm. And I try to distinguish that. And again, I don't mention this in the book so much, but not really at all. But it's one thing to say, post an article or, or post uh, this podcast between Tavis and Jeff Johnson, you know, whatever. And people can then go off site and look at that and think about it. But, but especially just these little quick statements and even theological statements uh, that you don't even have time to explain mm-hmm. or little jabs. And I just... And so that really was concerning to me, how many Christians just kind of take a jab or they, say, they tend to say things that you really doubt that they would say to someone's face. You know what I mean? And you're going, what are the scriptural principles to help us you know, in this, in, in this area? But how do you as a Christian present opinions that are, well, especially these days, extremely countercultural mm-hmm. and as they would interpret it, harmful Mm -hmm. or offensive. How do you present those truthfully Mm -hmm. without the, um, without the, the context of, of a normal conversation that you and I are having now? Like I could say something to you with a twinkle in my eye and a little bit of a smirk and you'd get it. Oh, like Tavis is joking around. Exactly. You know, there's no, there's no tone. It's just, it's just straight text. Right. But here's the question is how do you as a Christian then present truth mm-hmm. without appearing um, confrontational or hostile? And I'll say I was interviewed about my book by someone else not long ago. And, and, I'm, and I, one of the things I bring it down to in my own life is my, my stewardship. What is my stewardship? I have a clear stewardship to Grace Emanuel because they've given it to me. They voted me as their pastor. So therefore, I feel like I can address things there as needed, right? Um, I don't go to Myers, that's a you know local the grocery, store. grocery store, and go in the produce department and start addressing people. It's not my stewardship, right? Now that's not to say you can only speak to things when it's your stewardship, but but that's a good thing to say that look, in terms of being faithful, that I need to be faithful with my stewardships. You've invited, you know, you, you let me know at some time ago, hey, if, what about, maybe I can have you an interview if you know other men. Well, you invited me here, so now I have this opportunity in stewardship. So you could ask me, what do you think about this issue or that issue? And that's fine. But I didn't walk in here and say, oh, Tavis, I got something to say. Get the camera on. You know what I mean? It's, oh, right. You know what I'm saying? So I think one thing that with, with, I say that because I think social media can give a false sense to people that now I have a platform mm. and I need to speak to this issue. Mm. So let's just say you're dealing with uh, Gay Pride Month or whatever. Now, you could get on there and make a statement about you shouldn't be proud of this. And it's all true. But what if are you willing to cross the street, to that couple across the street that's living in sin? So you're saying this on social media, but you're not. would you go across the street and say that to your neighbors that are living in it? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's... What's the value of just being on social media and just making this statement that hundreds of people are going to see mm-hmm. and, you, and they just randomly come across it? Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. What's going to yeah. be more effective? Uh, and I'm not saying go across the street and say that to your neighbor, but mm-hmm. that's a check. If mm-hmm. I'm not willing to do that, mate, then am I really just in my safety zone 
in pro- it's easy to type anything. Yeah. With I mean, for blowback on social media, is that really suffering for the gospel? I got several mad faces. Man, I'm suffering for the truth. <laughs> it's it's kind of a this false world. Yeah. The issue is my responsibility is to address these things in the context of my everyday life or opportunities. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong to ever say those things on social media necessarily. I just, I just don't know they're very effective. Yeah. And I think Christians can have a false, maybe some Christians have a false guilt that well, if I'm on social media, I need to address these issues. Oh, right. Right. You know, and it is hard though, isn't it? Because Twitter in particular has been described as like the, you know, the, the town square mm-hmm. of the modern era. Mm-hmm. That's where all the news happens. That's right. where all the uh, truth gets dispelled mm-hmm. and lies get told too. Right. And um, there's, a, there's a very real sense that the neighborhood I live in and mm-hmm. the church that I go to are, are real. And the circles that I engage in on Twitter, just mm-hmm. taking one example of social media, that's just as real. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm making an argument here, right. and so not that I necessarily hold to this, but what right. I'm what I'm trying to get at is, um, you know, there's a sense I think I could encapsulate what you were saying earlier by the state that old saying like you know stay in your lane, mm-hmm. uh, or in my wife's Brazilian we'd say don't don't dig the spoon, mm-hmm. like don't get in between people that that's their problem. Mm-hmm. You don't need to interfere right. with that. That's right. that married couple's issue. Mm-hmm. You know, don't interject. Um, however, um, we're not that we're transhuman or anything, but but this world of social media and Twitter and the, I guess the metaverse is kind of here already, but this new, the advent of like virtual reality and mm-hmm. the AI, so all these right. things that are happening mm-hmm. that are in essence creating a new reality mm-hmm. or a new way of us existing as humans apart from just our physical hands and feet that we can walk around the sidewalks of our neighborhood Mm -hmm. now simply through the use of our eyeballs and our ears we're we're in a different right right, realm right that's that's the reason it's still real is because and this is getting to the theological part about it is that the other people in that virtual space are also image bearers of god christian or non right and so we have a we have a responsibility as Christians, not just to, as you make the argument, to tame our fingers, but also to actually be engaged mm-hmm. and not just be an observer sitting on the outside right. Right. watching it all go down right. without saying right. anything. Right. So I, I'm not saying it's easy, and I don't even know if I have a question in right. here for you, but just making that observation. I think of an answer, even though you don't have a question. <laughs> Um, you can just make another observation. So, so this is to qualify what I'm saying, okay? And I kind of make, I make some qualifications in the book. But th- that each person has to weigh out what their stewardships are in relationship to social media. So I'm not saying that it's, again, that it's wrong to use social media to address issues. But, and I've said this, I said this in the other interview I had, I've said this to our people, and, and it, it's just something that comes to mind is, I realize I am not Al Mohler. I am not John MacArthur. In other words, I know I'm not a well-known preacher, right? I know I'm not a well-known figure in our circles or in our in, our, in the evangelical world. I don't have any. I'm under no delusion that, you know, Jeff. You know, people are looking at, to Jeff Johnson for guidance outside of Grace Emanuel. So that doesn't mean I can't participate in those things. But I, but I recognize that, it, and my point is, is if I did have that kind of audience, let's say, Taming the Finger sells a million copies, you know, whatever just... We a, hope so. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and all of a sudden, that blows up, and this podcast blows up, and you know, whatever, and Tavis and Jeff Johnson, you know, uh, things like that do happen in God's providence, right? Then I might feel a greater sense of stewardship. You know, okay. people are looking to me, mm-hmm. not... Not, I'm not saying that proudly, but people are people right. are actually God has given this to me, and I think that's important to know because if you say, "Speak out, have a voice," well, you know what about a, a, a lady that's home with her kids all day, and she's thankful to have a voice at the end of the day because <laughs> yeah. she's just tried to corral the kids and get them trained, get them, and should she be on Twitter 
if she is or she's on, if she's on Facebook, should she be speaking to these matters? So my point is, is each person has to determine what their role is in this. And, I mean, even if you take issue with podcasts, I mean, how many podcasts are there now? I mean, There's lots of people. A million at least, yeah. And not, not that that's wrong or bad. That can be a mm-hmm. good thing. Mm-hmm. But as a pastor, do I have to have a podcast? You know, we've put out a few as a church or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I do, you know, will it make that, will it be even worth my time compared to other responsibilities? You know, here you are with a with a great organization, and this is gonna this really has the potential to get off the ground and become something people. Whereas I'm just the end of a cul de sac pastoring a church at probably a few hundred downloads over time. You know what I'm saying? So everybody has to determine: is it worth my tweet? Because hmm. if I tweet, then someone responds, then I feel the necessity to respond, and then that opens up, and then and. Uh, so that's does that make sense? Everybody's got yeah. to kind of figure out what is my role in the res- our role in the resistance of evil and promoting the truth are is our roles are different mm-hmm. based on our circumstances, mm-hmm. and I have to realize that I'm natured that I don't like conflict, so I realize I could go the other direction. Right? I see. Yeah. On the other hand, at the same time, I think there's a reality of I just know who I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not that at this point. May God God may never give me that kind of platform, and and I've also said you know there's a certain blessing in that because the bigger you are, the bigger target you become. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> did you hear what that Jeff Johnson said? He's crazy. No, and um, so that's part of it. I think each person has to determine what that is. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it can sometimes be distasteful if you just have no name Christian person just get up and just tweet something. And you're going well. There's a feeling almost like well. Who are you? <laughs> you know, it right. can sometimes, e- right. even though it's true, it can just seem out of, it can be just as, in other words, because what you're saying is true, this has become a new marketplace. This has become a part of our world. Well, then some of the same rules have to apply. So if you have some random person, even if you, you know, that goes out into a public square and just starts speaking the truth, it's not just what they're saying that offends. Sometimes people are looking at them like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. That's. I guess I don't know if that makes sense, but I just think each yeah. person has to weigh out what is my role with social media with respect to these things. And right now, I've determined it's just not my stewardship or place. And not be, not only that, I feel like, and I've even had a reminder of this without going into detail. In the not in the not too distant past, I've had some reminders that what I am doing is influential and does count in people's lives at the local level. Mm -hmm. And then I've said I've had more opportunities to speak in different conferences or do modules. And who knows where all that's going. Yeah. And I can't keep, and that's good that the Lord probably doesn't let me know because, you know, that might not be good for me. But but I was just reminded, you know, hey, Pastor, that thing you said a few years ago in counseling session, man, that really was the turning point. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing... You know what? That's not on social media, but that changed a lot. That changed the course of a person's life. Yeah, yeah. And I think there can be this maybe pressure that if I'm going to count, my face has got to be on something. I've got to have a podcast. I've got to have a statement. And you can miss some of the things that are right before you to do. Yeah. You know. And I just feel comfortable with that. It's where God's got me, and I feel like I'm being more used, more useful mm-hmm. than if I went home at night trying to make sure I'm in the latest. Yeah. Now for some men that is that maybe they're calling and that's where they're most useful. Mm-hmm. Then go for it, you know. Mm-hmm. I we had Brian um Chapel on here a few weeks ago mm-hmm. and he I asked him a question very related to this. You know, he's a very busy guy mm-hmm. and he's be, got this big name, you know, kind of like a Kevin DeYoung or mm-hmm. a MacArthur right. as you mentioned right. or like Sproul was. But I said but he he was very honest. He said, you know, there's a part of me that always wished for a more contemplative life, you know, sitting out mm-hmm. next to a lake reading, like you mentioned, right. like, mm-hmm. we, I, and I think that's, that's a shared desire for a lot of us at various levels of influence right? to where, oh, wouldn't that be not to get monastic about it, right? but just to think there's something to a quiet, insignificant life that is actually quite a blessing. Right. I, yeah. one of the, 
the best books that I've ever read is Ordinary by um, Michael Horton. All right. He yep. addresses some of those very mm-hmm. kinds of things mm-hmm. about this pressure to count, mm-hmm. you know, and without going into the details of the book, but it just the, the, the idea is that the point is, you know, just raising your kids, going to a local church that's not all that grand, the Lord meets with you, you know, it's that most of us are going to live ordinary lives. We're going to die. A hundred years from now, no one will remember who we are. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. And I, that was so helpful for me in the ministry, too, mm. because there is this pressure to have a thriving organization. they got this ministry. Right. We're on the cutting edge. And it's okay just to be a local church that meets together and does its best to win the lost and help God's people grow and love each other. Mm-hmm. And... So I, I think that's very important, I, even as a minister, because, again, I'm not well-known, but you are in a public life, at least with the people who do know you. And there are times where, you know, when you first go in the ministry, that's attractive, maybe even from a carnal perspective. Hmm. But, it is, but it is attractive. I can be influential. But after a while, you realize, well, that's not all it's cut, you know, that's not all it's cut out to be. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, so sometimes there's a desire of, like, I'd just like to be a regular guy, Comes to church with his family, participates. I can do the sound, and then go home, and 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 nobody knows who I am. Is I th- you probably you could ask the other pastors that when they're on sabbatical or vacation, how much they like going to another church and being anonymous, <laughs> right? And just being, hey, I'm here with my family. You know, nobody's looking to me. No one's going, hey, 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 can we can we chat before you leave? I know you're tired. You know, yeah. You know, there's an element yeah. of that. So I, I resonate with what uh, Brian Chapel said, that there's an element sometimes of just this retreated, retreat mm-hmm. life. Uh, and I think that probably comes from the pressures of ministry, and especially people like that who, you know, the more you're up the scale of, of people knowing you, there's probably more pressure, yeah. more demand. Hey, yeah. can you do this podcast? Can you write this book? Can you go over here? It just kind of... It snowballs. Yeah. It's like it, as soon as these doors start opening, they start opening faster and quicker. And Right. Yeah. Even just, yeah, even just opportunities I have to go and got some, I've told you about the stuff I have lined up for out, outside mm-hmm. ministries. Mm-hmm. They're wonderful opportunities, but after a while you can start, your tongue starts hanging out like, oh, I've got more one thing to prepare for, you know, yeah. going on with. And so uh, with greater greater opportunities comes greater work, greater responsibility. Yeah. So it can it can lead to that. Hey, you're being anonymous sounds pretty good. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, when I was younger, I uh, I tried my hand. At, well, I'm from Los Angeles originally, and after university, I came back to LA. And that's a very quiet, contemplated life. Oh right? yeah, very <laughs> quiet. And I I um, I did spend some years in commercial real estate, but I I got the itch to get into the film TV world. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing now because of that background. But at the time I wanted to be, you know, another well-known actor. And Mm -hmm. there were, there was a group that we are all Christians. We wanted to be well known. I, I have a couple friends who've gone on to do some big projects and they're still working. And, um, I, I, at this point in my life can say, I don't envy that at Mm -hmm. all. I love being anonymous. Right. And um, I couldn't imagine having it hard to walk down the street without people wanting to just feel mm-hmm. like they know you, mm-hmm. like everyone feels like they know right. you. And then, especially now with getting back to your book, with like the social media and the responsibility we have as Christians of um, feeling like everything that you say on there is is going to impact somebody mm-hmm. for good or mm-hmm. for evil. And uh, it really, it really makes you need to be careful, right? And like you know, conscientious, right? Right. Um, what are some What are some of the biggest dangers for Christians on social media? Not just in what we've been talking about of like the sins of envy or mm-hmm. of pride, but what about things that are outside of our control, like? being tracked by the government right, and right. Um, having your life on public display or data harvesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, are these things too that, hey, maybe we should limit our exposure 
-hmm. maybe so for some people not even I you know you just shouldn't even be on social media or because this is the new marketplace of ideas the public square do we have a responsibility as Christians because of our our um, our mission of evangelism you know to, to spread the kingdom like mm -hmm. or is that just per individual Christian like how, how do we measure what our engagement as a Christian should be yeah I am um... As far as like the, the government tracking and things like that, I'm not versed at all in, in as to they're listening the, to us right now the reality yeah. of or whatever yeah. right you know and uh, certainly to some degree there's only so much you probably can do about that unless you just retreated from this stuff altogether you didn't do any podcast you didn't do any whatever um, and you know and I try to prepare people for things that are coming I even said some things this past Sunday it has nothing to do with social media but just the fact that we have opponents. Paul talks about don't be startled by your opponents. The world wants to intimidate us with laws and so on. And, and so, yeah, we don't need to be naive as to how the government can use these things. You know, How do you do that without going off the rails with some real crazy idea of something? But yet at the same time, the government has a lot of power now and things can be tracked. And there's these algorithms. I mean, you know how, I don't know if you're on Facebook or, 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 or social media, but you can look something up on, on your computer, like maybe YouTube or, or maybe Google or whatever, and the next thing you know, you're getting advertisements on Facebook. What's really scary is you can <laughs> have a conversation. I guess that's how it works because I've noticed the connection. Like, yeah. oh, I just, now I'm looking, you know. Well, you uh, you try this sometime. You can have a conversation with somebody and your phone's just laying there, not really on. And the next thing you know, it's like, oh, I was just talking about, you know, a jacket. And now there's ads for jackets. Oh my goodness. I never noticed never that, but that's weird. Now, now you're going to be aware. <laughs> yeah, right. So now I'm aware. So honey, you know, but, you know, my, but, but on the other hand, but on a, even on a more practical basis than that, my wife has been like, you know, you don't, 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 you don't put too much information about yourself on Facebook as far as your information Oh right. or if we're on vacation, it's one thing for me to put the little dot from going from, you know, Grand Rapids to California, whatever. But when we're all gone from the home, on vacation, she just don't post. You mm -hmm. know, post. You know, we can post the pictures later, and so I do think we have to be wise in our use of social media. The, the pictures of your kids, as far as like uh, tracking as to where they're at when you take that picture. What if people are looking? You know that that kind of stuff, and so I think we need to be aware of that, and then keep in the back of our minds. Okay, what what could the government be doing? How can they be trying to you know and to, and I think to be aware of the of the subtle influence of ads and how that kind of stuff works, and and just also with social media as it is with any kind of internet access, provocative images and uh, so on sexually, and just to be aware that oh keep going scrolling you know or or hide that or whatever, that it's always an area. It's just like any technology, you know. Um, I've heard it once described. You know, when when cars were invented, it's great. But cars have been used for evil purposes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, and so there's always the devil's ploy to take things that are in themselves good and they're not harmful in themselves. And Christians, it really comes down to Christians using these things righteously and using them wisely. Okay, so that brings up a question for me is this, is that um, we believe in a sovereign God. Mm -hmm. So that kind of puts a check on this idea of I mean, I've seen it promulgated so often of like the government's partnering with big tech and mm -hmm. it's kind of like government, 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 this big, bad, evil thing. Mm -hmm. But if we do believe in a God who is sovereign, right. he, he gave us at the very minimum, he, he allowed, if we want to talk about the language of allowance, you know, or permitted in a more Calvinistic sense, we would say he willed social media to happen and to come mm -hmm. about through human agency. Mm -hmm. But why? Right. That, that's my question to you. Yeah. Why? And this is us just kind of theolog theologizing right. ad hoc, but right. why, why would God allow, permit, design something like social media? And then I know we talked before we started recording about... Um, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. the whole chat GPT and so forth revolution and things that are even coming after that. Why do you think God 
has willed these things into existence? I don't know. <laughs> but I, from a the, Christian perspective. But I say that. In other words, yeah. I, when I say I don't know, I don't know his purpose in his mind as he ordained right. this and brought it to pass. Obviously, I know you know that as well. As far as practically looking at its effects, you know, you can think of it's just like so many other things that God has willed and brought into in, into to, to pass. You know, think of internet in general, not just social media. So let's just broaden it. You know, we now have sermon audio. Mm-hmm. We're doing this. This is going to be placed on YouTube, and people can access it. It can be a blessing to them, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can see, wow, great good can be done through this. But yet also, a lot of evil is done. And that's true in different areas of life, arenas of life. And one thing that it does is, and obviously God wills all the effects. One is it it uh, it reveals righteous character and evil character. Interesting. You know? Um, I, so it's somewhat of a... Uh for individual people, we're able to kind of gauge well, think character. Of, well, think about it this way. I, Jerry Bridges wrote a book some time ago, and I haven't read the whole book, but it's The Joy of Fearing God. And he talks about the fear of the Lord being the beginning of knowledge. And he says, unbelievers and believers all have the same facts, but they don't have the same knowledge. Hmm. In, in other words, one doctor does something with a scalpel or triceps or whatever you call them that's really good. He knows how to use it, but if he doesn't, and he does it in the fear of God, let's say, and something good happens, without going into detail, <laughs> some doctors use those things for very evil purposes. Mm-hmm. That's not the same knowledge. You understand? Mm-hmm. They have the same facts, mm-hmm. so some you know integers are integers for both lost and, and saved men, but wicked men can do evil things with math equations mm. and put together the inventors of evil things the Bible talks about. The righteous can take that and serve. So I think about um, Cain's line in Genesis 4. It says some of those in his line invented musical instruments, some implements. Now when I go to Lowe's or to Home Depot and I buy a piece of equipment or a hammer or some uh, tool, I don't do research to make sure a Christian invented it. Right? I, because God in his common grace, I know that's a kind of sometimes a debated phrase, but in his goodness has overruled and caused a lot of lost men to invent things that are very helpful, but they end up often using them for evil. So music's not evil. Musical instruments are not evil. We can use them for, for good things. Mm-hmm. A lot of people use them for evil things. And so I see that like with social media and Internet. You know, whoever invented it, lost or saved, you know, saved people can take it and... Use it for good purposes. And so you say, why did God will it? Well, you know, it reveals character. Some people use it for evil things. Some people use it for bad things. And I think as Christians, what we can't say is, well, lost people came up with it, so let's put it aside. Or lost people use this for for evil things, so let's put it aside. Mm. Um, Is it something that uh, that we can um, take and sanctify it for good and solid purposes? And... You know what all God's purposes are in the end for this. I don't know, but I do th- know that that's one of the things that happens is He wills things, even lost people to invent things that they might have had evil purposes for. And but lo- saved people can take those things and use them for good purposes. Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah, it, it, it makes sense, and it, it really aligns with even just the title of your book, mm-hmm. the, the Taming of the Fingers. It and just having read through this. The taming aspect, like we have a responsibility as Christians to not just be consumers of social media, Mm -hmm. but when we are actively engaged in it, to whatever degree, we need to be um, aware Mm -hmm. and and in control, like self-discipline, self-control, these basic Christian virtues, um, which you describe as taming. Mm-hmm. Let me let's let's wrap things up here with just a question about the book itself. Mm-hmm. We you do you hope it sells a million copies, me too. <laughs> and but ultimately what um what impact would you love to see if in an, in a perfect scenario, right. what impact would you love to see this book have 
on Christianity, all of Christianity right. that is in social media. Well, as I say in the in the conclusion of the book, is that you know it's not meant to be exhaustive. The mm-hmm. the book could be qualified many different ways. We could sit here for another hour and say, "What about this? You said this. Well, I need to qualify that because you just it's like a, I say in the book last part of the book. It's like a sermon. You can't qualify everything in a sermon. It's long haul. So I can't send out a new book each week going, okay, let me qualify this or that. The whole purpose of the book is to cause pause and reflection on one's use of social media. And if it does that, that's what I want people to think about especially is, okay, so, okay, I post a lot on social media about political things. Okay, well, let me pause and ask myself these five questions. Am I calm? So am I going into this spirit-filled thinking you know, is, is it the right time to say it? Have I pondered and thought through my words carefully? Have I thought about their impact on my brothers at church? Have I thought about, could this be unnecessarily offensive? Mm. Am I just blowing off steam because of, a, of, of the newscast I just watched? Should I sleep on it? Just to really think through those things, because I just think with social media, it's so easy to separate our worlds and say, now, I wouldn't do that talking to a group of Christians because they would be offended mm-hmm. or they that's not the right timing. But I get on social media, I can just, I, there's a tendency, I think, to cast those things aside because I'm in this other world. And so my, the biggest impact is cause people to have pause and reflection and make whatever adjustments are necessary to their own use of social media. For some people, they might take the suggestion that maybe I shouldn't be on it all because I can't control myself. You know, others, it may be maybe, as I say in the conscientious chapter, I am a conscientious, I talk about the confession of sin on social media. Mm. I mean, how often do you see that on Twitter? Folks, I'm sorry, the last few tweets were really sinful. Please mm. forgive me. Mm-hmm. I have seen it a few times. Have you seen that? Okay. Yeah, but so, very, not very rarely. Right, but Usually I mean... Usually it's people doubling down. But. Right, yeah, and so it's kind of like saying, hey, look, hey, I, folks, I'm sorry, in the last few... I, mean, I'm not, I can't go over every post because you don't remember them. Man, I've really had a jagged spirit. Mm. And... What could that do for the cause of truth? Oh, Christians are humble. Really, they, you know, <laughs> cry, you know. And so it's just, that's the main thing. Just pause, reflection, and adjust where you need to. Mm. And it's it's really meant to just be a pastoral, you know, practical. Let's just think through the principles of yeah. communication. Yeah. So your elders have given you permission to to write. Mm-hmm. What's What's on the horizon from you? Well, I've got different... Th- that's the problem because I think about what should I be spending my time writing on. And mm-hmm. I'm sure that... I asked them about one project. I did a sermon series on um, conforming to the emotional life of Christ. Oh, okay. I've done a couple of... That sounds of, very interesting. I've, come, I've done a couple of conferences where I took that information and condensed it down. Okay. So, so you've spoken on that a few times. So a few times. And so I've I've asked permission, could I could I go do some writing on it? And I'm sure if I switched, they would let me. It's the idea of them giving me time to write. I don't think they really are going to press me down. You need to write that. So mm-hmm. I'd like to to put that in print form at some mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a little harder of a project, just just taking that material and putting it into a written form. Yeah. Because as you probably know, it you, you can't just take things you've preached and just here you go, you have to adjust, say it differently. And there, there's a, my master's thesis that I did when I, uh, for seminary was on um, Judas Iscariot. And I basically go through most of the passages about him. So I've thought about that might be a good book, The Real Gospel According to Judas. So I've got material. And, That's a great title. And so I've thought about, take because I've got that, most of the material for it. It would still take a lot of adjusting and editing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, I'm closer with that, so maybe I should just get that done because I've always had that in the, my back pocket wanting to, yeah. to, pr- to produce that. Yeah. And um, I've also thought about putting something out about the call of the ministry, but there's a lot of books about that too in, 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 that float around. So I, I, th- I want to do something that, that even like this, I think I, I, there may be other books like this, but I couldn't think of any. So it's not, you don't have a lot of this kind of book going around. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to do something mm-hmm. that would actually fill a need and not just, you know, oh, that's, oh, that's a dime a dozen, you know, that yeah. everybody writes on that. Yeah. You know? So so I've got some stuff like that. And uh, I've got another project that I might do with a, a, fr- a pastor friend of mine that, you know, that's maybe a little longer term too. I don't mm-hmm. know. Or my, mm-hmm. Maybe not so much, but 
So I've got a few things that I could, it's just focusing on one and narrowing it down. Yeah, I, I hope you publish the gospel according to Judas before John MacArthur leaves this world <laughs> and send him a copy. Yeah, yeah, he that would actually... Bring, that would bring your whole life full circle because you talked oh, about yeah. the gospel according to Jesus oh, as yeah. instrumental in your yeah, when, yeah, in I've, high school. I've never had the privilege of, of meeting him in person. I've been yeah. out to Grace Community for the, for the, yeah. for the um, Shepherds, Shepherds Conference a few t- uh, several times, and uh, but I, I owe a lot to him mm-hmm. because... Uh, um, he, he said something once, I think once, and I feel this way, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring tidings, good tidings. And I think he made an application about there's something special about that person that God used in your life. How beautiful are their feet? They brought you the gospel. And so although I n- don't know him at all, you know, I've, uh, you know, when I get to heaven at least, I want to give him a thanks because that, that book was so instrumental. And when I was first, not even before, even before I was reformed, but I had started coming to more of a true gospel view. I mean, he was a friend of mine through his books, as it were, hmm. because that was, yeah. I was kind of in a circles where that stuff wasn't preached really that much. And so, so yeah, that, so that would be, that'd be a full circle, you know, to be able to do something like that'd be great. <laughs> and, uh, it, but, um, but yeah, I would probably call it like something like the real gospel according to Judas. Cause you know, there's the, the, the gospel of Judas Oh yeah, it's even printed. Yeah, and um, but yeah, the, and and I didn't know this, but John MacArthur did his master's thesis on Judas. Did he really? Yeah, I didn't I, even know. Yeah, that. I heard him say that at least. Huh. So anyway, yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. But maybe so. You think the real gospel of Judas would be a, what I should do next? Well, what do you think? Well, so when I was doing my uh, postgraduate work in England, mm-hmm. I remember. I wasn't a gospels guy. I worked on Romans, and um, but I remember there were people working in the gospels who were um, talking about Judas. And I remember when I would go to certain like SBL or Society of Biblical Literature, these various conferences at the academic level, um, there were people working specifically on Judas. Mm. And I always found that fascinating because I've I've always found him a very interesting character, mm-hmm. especially because he was he was in the inner circle and for so right. long, and nobody knew. Right. Um, I I don't think he even knew. I mean, you would probably be well, able to know much more than I'm right. just saying off the top of right. my head right now. But I think of the 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 uh, the supper scene mm-hmm. where everyone's looking around like, who is it? Is it me? Is it me? Right. Is it me? Right. You know, and. It, they didn't all turn and look at Judas and go. I know. Is it him? Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think. By the way, I just throw this in. I, I think it's wrong to assume that he was planning to betray from the beginning. It never says that he was exactly, planning. Exactly. Jesus knew, but it doesn't mean Judas knew. But we read the Gospels um, ideally as Christians many times over in our life, and so we start off Matthew one one, knowing that Judas is going to betray him, mm-hmm. and yet. That doesn't mean Judas knew at the time. Judas, it doesn't mean Judas. At some knew. point, he made that decision. Yeah. And uh, so, anyway, yeah. And I'm also really interested. It's a as a young man or as a kid, I would say, um, I always found it really gruesome the description of his death. And I was like, how did oh. that happen? Anyway, that's wow. we can that's save that for the next time. You right. Come. Yeah. <laughs> Six years from now, when that's been, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You're local. I'll, I'll get yeah. you back here yeah. soon. There's yeah. other questions I want to ask. Right, so yeah. this will be kind of a foreshadowing for next time. But um, I would like to d- dive deeper next time into your uh, that that childhood journey, mm-hmm. and and specifically maybe talk a bit more about when so, you know did someone hand you MacArthur's book? Mm-hmm. What was happening before that? You know right. that whole kind of the story. Gets, yeah, we can do that. It's really great. interesting. I love to tell the story of but, how the uh, Lord. Worked in my life, yeah, and especially because sure. I just having read about your story other places. This, uh, like I said at the very beginning of this conversation, mm-hmm. is that whole um, how do we describe it? Kind of like that peaks and valleys of like, am I saved? Am I not? Am I saved? Am I not? Right. And you go to the my experience growing up was very similar. You, know, you go to the Christian camp and you're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. Mm-hmm. And then you come home and you're like, oh man. I'm I don't right. know if I'm a Christian. I've just done all right. these bad things after leaving the right. the Christian camp and on and on and on. And to finally reach that point where it's not, at least for me, it was like, oh, it's not actually about my feelings mm-hmm. so much. Right. It's about what the Bible says 
is true saving faith right. mm -hmm. and what it means to actually be born again. All right. Love to have that oh, conversation. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Really enjoyed this. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.